Hi and hello everyone. So let us discuss uh, five MCQs important for your upcoming exams. So let us take up the first MCQ. Which of the following is contraindicated in hypertension in pregnancy? So these are repeatedly asked questions. Pregnancy, which is contraindicated, labetalol, enalapril, nifedipine sustain release, methyl dopa. So try to answer this question. Yes. So if your answer is B, enalapril, then you are right. So please understand enalapril belongs to AC inhibitor. Anything ending with pril is AC inhibitor. So AC inhibitor or ARBs, they end with sartans. These are contraindicated in pregnancy. The reason is AC inhibitor ARBs, they are teratogenic. They can cause renal agenesis particularly in second and third trimester. Now, labetalol is safe in pregnancy and it is the drug of choice for hypertension in pregnant women. Now, nifedipine is a calcium channel blocker. It is a dihydropyridine. It is also safe in pregnancy. Methyl dopa is also safe in pregnant women. Suppose same question if they want to alter. Suppose a patient has hypertension and bronchial asthma and she is pregnant so the question is try to answer this can we use labetalol so i want your answer yes or no if you are telling no yes your answer is correct labetalol is not given reason is labetalol is a non-selective beta blocker it's a non-selective beta blocker so what is the problem if you use non-selective beta blocker they block beta 2 and they can cause bronchoconstriction and worsen asthma. So in that situation, I can prefer either nifedipine or I can prefer methyl dopa. So the question we are discussing here is, what is contraindicated antihypertensives are AC inhibitor or ARBs. What we understand from this will be what anti-epileptic drug is contraindicated in pregnant women. Take a guess quickly, which is frequently asked. Valproate. Why valproate is contraindicated in pregnancy? Because of neural tube defect. And another drug which is contraindicated in pregnant women is phenytoin. Phenytoin. Because it causes fetal identity syndrome. So what I want you people to comment in the comment section is which are safe or anti-epileptic in pregnant women. Now anti-TB drug which is absolutely contraindicated is streptomycin or any amino leukocytes. Why amino leukocytes? Because they are known for phototoxicity. They can damage the ear of the fetus. Which is antigogal and contraindicated in pregnant women. Warfarin, particularly contraindicated in first trimester. The antithyroid drugs contraindicated in first trimester are the carbimazole or methimazole. Why? Because they are known to produce teratogenicity in first trimester antibiotics which are contraindicated in pregnancy remember the mnemonic fat fat means f for fluoroquinolones a for amylglycide t for tetracycline so these are not given so that is the purpose of this mcq very high yield points pregnancy and drugs contraindicated very very important moving on to the next mcq Indomethacin should not be used with AC inhibitor because. So you take your time and answer. Options are it may increase the risk of hyperkalemia. It may increase the risk of hypotension. It may increase the risk of hypoglycemia and it may increase the risk of gastritis. So try to answer this waiting for your answers. So what is Indomethacin? Indomethacin is an NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And what is AC inhibitor? They inhibit the enzyme AC and their names end with pril. So the combination of these two drugs can increase the risk of hyperkalemia. NSAIDs can induce gastritis but the combination with pril will not have anything to do with that. So let us understand what is the problem when we use this together. 
So whenever you combine an side like indomethacin or diclofenac with AC inhibitor, what is the problem? Now NS side, what they do is they cause sodium retention. Along with that, there is water also retains. So because sodium and water has retained, so there is a chance of edema and there is a chance of increase in blood pressure. AC inhibitor, they block the RAS pathway and reduce the aldosterone level. So they decrease blood pressure and they decrease edema. So the first point is, if I am giving AC inhibitor with NS side, the AC inhibitor advantage of decreasing BP, that is hypotension or antihypertensive effect will be reduced and the decrease in edema is also reduced. So this combination should not be given. Second, NS side, what they do, NS side, they decrease the prostaglandin synthesis, you know it. NS side block COX enzyme, decrease prostaglandin. So if you decrease prostaglandin, there is decrease in renal blood flow. And if there is renal blood flow is reduced, potassium cannot be excreted out. So what happens? They increase potassium levels because kidney is not functioning properly. Now AC inhibitor or any drug affecting RAS pathway, they also increase potassium because when you decrease aldosterone synthesis, potassium level goes up. So the problem of giving NS side and AC inhibitor is there is a risk of hyperkalemia. So that is what the question is about. Let us read. So when we combine them, there is an increased risk of hyperkalemia. It may increase the risk of hypertension. No. It may increase the risk of hyperglycemia. No. Gastritis. No. So in fact, if we are using AC inhibitor, suppose a patient is having hypertension and he is on AC inhibitor prill. And if I start giving NS side, the prill will not reduce the BP properly. The antihypertensive effect will be blunted. So usually that was the question asked, but recently this had appeared. Right. So can you tell me where to use indomethacin in the comment section, whether we use indomethacin to open PDA or to close PDA. So you have to comment and tell me what is the use of indomethacin. Yes. So let us move on to the third MCQ. Which of the following anti-diabetic drug is preferred in patient with heart and kidney disease? Now, recently, before I come to the answer, try to answer from your end. Your answer is SGLT2 inhibitors. That means you are right. SGLT2 inhibitors, they end with gliflozins. They are gliflozins. For example, canagliflozin, empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, like that. DP4 inhibitors, they end with gliptin, citagliptin, linagliptin, vildagliptin. And PPR gamma agonist is nothing but pioglitazone. Pioglitazone. And biguanide is metformin. So, what is the drug which can be used in heart and kidney disease and also for diabetes? SGLT2 inhibitors. Why? Let us see. Now, the major mechanism of action of SGLT2 inhibitor is in the nephron, that is PCT. So, here they inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and glucose. So, they inhibit SGLT2. So, what is lost in the urine is sodium is lost, glucose is lost. Since sodium is lost, it is like a diuretic effect. So, that is why it is helpful in CHF and they have found out it is going to reduce mortality and hospitalization in CHF. And also certain studies have shown it is also effect good for cardiovascular disease risk. Suppose a patient is having more risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for them also it is beneficial. And also it is also studies have shown these are helpful for chronic kidney disease patients. And also we know that these are the drugs approved for diabetes type 2. So recently, remember this gliflozins are used in four conditions that is CHF, cardiovascular disease, CKD and diabetes type 2. And this has been tested in every, every different type of exams, gliflozins. And what I want you to write in the comment section is what adverse effect comes to your mind when you read about gliflozins? Main adverse effect, put it in the comment box. I want that. 
so coming back to the question it is sgld2 inhibitors now coming to the next question mechanism of action of n acetylcysteine in management of paracetamol overdose so we all know that paracetamol overdose the drug of choice is n acetylcysteine then why are we using it so write read the options and try to answer it inhibits enzyme responsible for producing napqi and enhances renal clearance of napqi replenishes glutathione levels it has direct antioxidant effect to neutralize napqi so the answer will be it replenishes glutathione levels what is that let me tell you so what happens when we give paracetamol paracetamol usually 98% of paracetamol will undergo glucuronide conjugation and sulfate conjugation and eliminate it but 1 to 2% of paracetamol will be metabolized by an enzyme called cytochrome 2e1 and that will give to rise to a toxic metabolite called napqi which can cause toxicity to the liver so it will cause hepatotoxic hepatotoxicity usually when we take dolo paracetamol nothing will happen liver is fine because this napqi is neutralized or it is uh, reduced by the glutathione so there is something called glutathione it undergoes glutathione conjugation and that napqi is neutralized so it is made inactive so that's why if you take paracetamol your liver is not going to get affected because whatever napqi generated is made inactive by glutathione so no hepatoxicity imagine a patient taking overdose of paracetamol when they take overdose of paracetamol this pathway gets saturated the enzymes are limited so this pathway gets more and more and more activated so it will generate more and more napqi and more and more napqi will damage the liver because this napqi cannot be made inactive by glutathione stores because they also will get to over so if you don't replenish glutathione the liver damage continues so what we do is we add n acetylcysteine which will replenish glutathione and will make napqi inactive that's the reason why the antidote for paracetamol toxicity is n acetylcysteine because it replenishes glutathione store so early you use the n acetylcysteine so you can you can protect the liver so coming back to the question why do we add n acetylcysteine because it replenishes glutathione levels right so the last question a patient is diagnosed with diabetes type 2 hba1c of 8.5% you know it is very high and after 3 months therapy with metformin 1000 mg twice daily hba1c decreased to 7.5% so already patient is on metformin metformin 1000 mg twice daily means already is on maximum dose of metformin 2000 mg what would be the most appropriate next step in treating this patient increase the dose of metformin add a carbos add pioglutazone add exenatide so try to guess your answers now newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes the drug of choice we all know is metformin so what we do is we give metformin because it's an insulin sensitizer and the maximum dose in a day is 2000 mg so once we give this drug still it is not being controlled then we can give either sulfonylurea or dpp4 inhibitors or we can give pioglutazone or we can give sglt2 inhibitors so these are the second line drugs so now the patient is already being in metformin then we have to go for a second line drug increasing the dose of metformin not required already we have given maximum acarbos 50 mg 3 times daily see acarbos is a alpha glucosidase inhibitor that is going to help if postprandial blood sugars are high but here in the question they are not mentioned so we are going to rule out this add pioglutazone once a day this is the most appropriate now add exenatide exenatide is a glp1 agonist 
and these are injections and these should be used later stages so here the answer will be add pyogrodazone 50 milligram once a day is the appropriate answer for this question so i hope you found this uh, video useful for you so try to revise these things again and again any feedback give it and if you like this content like the video and subscribe to the channel share to your friends thank you all